Hello, this is Nick, and welcome to an unusual edition of the IoT Leaders podcast, because in this episode, I'm actually going to interview somebody from SI. And the reason of doing that is that um, we were uh, luckily enough to be able to recruit uh, somebody called Larry Socker. Uh, he's fairly well known in the industry. He's based in the US on the East Coast. And he was 26 years at Accenture and ran some very large global uh, functions for the company. And actually, as you'll hear in the podcast, the reason he's working uh, for uh, us now is a couple of reasons. One is I knew Larry when he was at Accenture, but secondly, when he was leaving Accenture and wondering what to do, he was listening to podcasts. He heard the IoT Leaders podcast and says, I want to join. So uh, we never thought that would happen when we uh, decided to uh, uh, do this series, but that's one of the reasons he joined. More importantly, uh, he's a big visionary in the industry and has been really instrumental in taking our annual predictions report uh, to the next level. This is the fourth year that we've done it. And he really, as you'll hear in a minute, takes it to the next level in terms of a lot of the background around the change in the industry and why uh, these five predictions that we go through, uh, we really believe in 2023, um, will all come to a head. And, and what it means for um, people uh, doing IoT projects and indeed for the players in the industry. So it's a, I would call it a meaty episode. It's action packed. And I hope as always that you're going to enjoy it. So with that, uh, we'll hand over now to the podcast with Larry Socker, who is the SVP of um, Strategy and Alliances here at SA. So Larry, welcome to the IoT Leaders Podcast. Great to be here, Nick. I've uh, been looking forward to this. Well, I, you you have in more ways than one, because uh, for our listeners or indeed uh, viewers, if you're watching this on YouTube, um, uh, we've done somewhere in around 25 IoT Leaders podcasts. But actually, this is um, an unusual one for two reasons. One is it's the first one that we've done with a member of SI's management team on it. So it's uh, Larry and I. And secondly, Larry, uh, you actually joined SI because of the IoT Leaders podcast, didn't you? That, that's right. Um, I actually joined back of uh, January of this year to drive uh, all of our strategy and alliances. And um, interesting story about how I got here. I, I spent the last 26 years at Accenture, um, where where the eight, the, the previous eight of those, I, I ran all of Accenture's offerings for global cloud and infrastructure. So everything around hybrid cloud, workplace, um, um, man, um, service management, and network. Prior to that, I'd actually run our enterprise business for a couple of years. And during that time, um, we had a very big go to market with uh, Cisco, where Nick was actually running services at Cisco right. at the time. Yeah. And I got to know Nick. He, he was a big part of our executive sponsors. So we, we had known each other for quite some time. And then previous to that, I'd actually run, I was lead architect and ran Accenture service provider network practice for, for 12 years. But it was interesting when I left Accenture back in uh, September of 2021. Uh, you know, I was doing uh, some advisory stuff for a bunch of different firms, a computer vision firm and, and a few others, and um, started to look to what, what, what was the next thing I wanted to do in my chapter. And I was really looking between, you, you know, IoT and networking, kind of my back to, to my roots and um, came across, I was listening to a bunch of podcasts um, out there and they came across the you know, leaders in IoT podcast. I'm like, wow, that's Nick. It's been a while. Did, you know, I knew you'd done the work with the uh, Rails and and w with Rob Lloyd, but had, hadn't figured out uh, where you had landed. Um, so I started uh, listening to the podcast, uh, went into the website, and was uh, looking around. And one of the uh, the BDRs reached out and said, "Hey, see your interest in the site." Send an email back, copied Nick on it, and you know, 10, 15 minutes later, got a call, and and hey, you're right. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, well. That's uh, that saved the uh, recruitment fee. I tell you. Exactly. Um, <laughs> so what we're going to talk about this time um, is uh, just to uh, give some context for everyone. Um, is uh, each year for the last four, we've done a predictions report. Some of you will be very familiar uh, with it. Maybe some, not so much. And we basically uh, found that a lot of people were saying to us, well, you're in IoT all the time, you know, 24 seven day in, day out. Where is this all going? Because it seems to be changing and uh, the landscape. Can you just take a step back, zoom out and uh, give us some idea of where it's going? So we started doing that and we produced the first one, as I said, four years ago. And I think we were taken by surprise. It was our number one downloaded piece of collateral. So we've repeated it each year. 
And each year, it's not only our number one downloaded piece of collateral as a company, but um, it's actually it attracts new people to the site, which, uh, as you said, attracted you. But actually, now the press pick it up, and I think it gets sort of syndicated, so to speak, or republished, uh, whatever the word is, uh, into a few hundred uh, publications around the world. So anyway, it's got a life of its own. And uh, so here we are, uh, the 2023. Uh, predictions it's uh, already available on our website iot predictions report but what we're going to do in this podcast is we're going to go through the five predictions and larry as he said it now runs our strategy for us as well as our alliances and so uh, larry and i were both heavily involved in the predictions report so this time we're going to uh, turn the tables I, i'm going to ask you the questions larry and um, you're going to explain uh, why we think like that. So actually, you're speaking on yep. my behalf. So we so <laughs> got to make sure we get it right. Uh, so um, uh, there's five. So let's dive straight in. And the first prediction um, is the MNO, the mobile network operator, proprietary lock-in finally cracks in 2023 with increased choice and the hyperscaler threat. So what's yep. that all about? Well, I think this has been a trend that's been happening for years. So if you take a look at it, the, the mobile network operators have, uh, have obviously dominated connectivity in the cellular world. Um, that, that's that been the predominance of, of IoT. And it started breaking down with the uh, evolution of the SIM. So when they used to have a you know physical SIM that plugged in the device that was provided by the operator, you know they had a very good stranglehold on that. Over time, the SIM has evolved and we've started to get new technology. So eSIM, so embedded SIM technology, it's now evolving into iSIM where it's integrated in the chip. Um, so I think that's been laying some of the foundation. There's also been a number of different trends, um, like the ability to do remote SIM provisioning where you could actually change the different operator profiles. But the lock-in that the SIM had provided uh, to the service providers has been chipping away for some time. Now, the service providers still predominantly maintain control of it. Um, but at least the building blocks had, had started to, to, to kind of erode, uh, at least the, the barrier of entry has, has started to erode to make it easier to make those changes. Now enter the hyperscalers. Um, so that's your Amazons, your Microsofts, your Googles. Um, obviously, they, they've, they've done a tremendous job shifting the enterprise out of the data center, you know, taking on compute and all the services and building that. Uh, but they started to realize that the future of compute couldn't just be in these data centers in the cloud. If you take a look at, there's a number of forces out there, um, in particular, you know, that are that is actually pushing compute to the edge. And Gartner's got a phenomenal quote that by uh, 2025, 75% of all data will not only be process, uh, produced, but processed outside the cloud. And and the reason for that is is actually pretty simple. If you're familiar with Moore's law, Moore's law used to be for decades, it was, you know, every 24 months price performance and compute doubled. I'm sorry, 18 months, but you know, it took two decades, it finally slowed to 24. But but basically compute processing power, it you know, continues to accelerate. Now, if and that means just a proliferation of data. It's gonna, you know, keeps exploding. It can go into lower and lower cost devices, you know, to mobile phones, to sensors, et cetera. Um, but if you look at the networks that are needed to carry that data from the devices, which are increasingly smaller and more distributed, you know, in, you know, uh, in the Internet of Things, um, back into cloud, the networks will never keep pace. So if you think about our upgrades, if you think about going from LTE, for, you know, 4G to 5G, which is all the hype right now, that was a 10 or 12 year cycle. So even with Moore's law slowing down from you know from 18 to 24 months, it's still the networks will still never keep pace. So the the natural conclusion of that is processing needs to be on the edge. So you, you're going to need to actually do the compute and processing out there. And as a result, the hyperscalers realized, hey, we can't just sit back in the cloud and in the data center. We've got to push to the edge. And if you if you think about it, Microsoft was the first to see that. If you Azure Stack, I think it was as early as 2008, where they started to push out and probably initially target at the data center, but but they expanded that to Azure Stack Edge, you, you know, their their IoT plug and play gateways. So they brought a bunch of solutions out there, you know, 
similarly, a- Amazon with you know with green grass without you know, without posts have been pushing out. So so I think they've all woken up to that. With hey, if seventy five comp- percent of the compute's going to be out there, we need to move there. And I think them moving out has started to put a bit of a disruption in the service provider. Right. So putting connecting those threads. Um, um, you talked about the technology trend, which, as you say, we've talked about that a lot. Um, but the the sim is no longer locked to the uh, MMO. Right. so that's a technical um, uh, thing. But it's massively significant because it's also a um, a business uh, change uh, because it means right. that the MNO cannot, you know, I've used the phrase before, control the game and right. pick the roaming agreements. What you're adding to it here is it's not just that, it's not just the um, evolution of the eSIM and the and the EUICC standard, the uncoupling or the, the undoing of the proprietary lock that's been in place for over 40 years. It's also the fact that the hyperscalers, um, they always follow the data. I mean, they follow the money, right. but they basically follow the data from the data center right. to the cloud. And now what the cloud is no longer the edge is a way of right. saying what you're saying. The, the new edge is 75% of the uh, data is processed, generated, processed at the edge, which means the applications will be edge resident. So Correct. we have to think about IoT in terms of, you know, a coffee, we've talked about it a lot, a lot on this podcast, you know, a, a coffee machine, uh, last week's uh, episode with Bioform is it's a healthcare device. Right. But edge aggregation is also IoT. It's where IT meets OT. And yep. the operations technology and the and and the edge devices are are um, are IoT in that they're processing applications they have uh, and and they also have to backhaul the data often Correct. through MNOs, um, but MNOs who don't have a lock on the device anymore. So now you've got sort of a, a, a whole new category of devices. You've got MNOs without a lock. And and the you and and this this choice and then you've got the hyperscalers who are going to follow the money, and they're going to go next to the edge and they have they are truly global and have all the money. It, it, so, so it's these three forces are, are like colliding. Well, you hit one at the end. The truly global. If you think about, although you've got some big operators around there, they're typically they're regional companies. They operate in certain geographies, and that's a huge advantage the hyperscalers have. They are truly global entities. So right. as they push out. Um, you know, and the enterprises are sitting out there saying, hey, I, you know, these enterprises want to deploy a solution globally. They don't want to have to deal with 20 different operators so they can deal with one hyperscaler and then find someone in the middle to put that connectivity together. It becomes a, you know, it becomes much more attractive than trying to stitch it together themselves. So I think the the hyperscalers, they've already done a great job with the cloud. They, they now, as they start to push to the edge, can really start to disrupt the market. And what's interesting is they starting to, they seeing the need for the networking, right? Because you know, their networking was usually, you know, into the data center, they're already pushing out there. So you look at a Microsoft's been buying, uh, you know, MetaSwitch, Affirm Networks, Network Solutions, you know, Amazon's launched a private 5G. So they, they've they understood that networking plays an integral role. You, you've obviously got to connect the edge and are certainly aggressively getting there. So, so it becomes very disruptive to the m and So all change, which, which is a the theme of the 2023 report, is that it's sort of, you ain't, if I had to sum it up, you know, you ain't seen nothing yet. We've been talking about disruption, but 2023 is where the each of the five uh, in themselves as, as disruptive trends accelerate and they collide. And so Correct. let's go to the second one, um, because uh, you mentioned uh, private networks. Yep. Uh, and the second prediction um, is, is that interoperability between public and private networks becomes a priority. So maybe yeah. uh, just just in case there's anybody out there who doesn't know what a private network is, maybe maybe is maybe just start off with people say what what's a private network, just explain what it is, and then why does interoperability between public and private become a priority in Twitter? Sure. Well, well, if you think about right now, all the cellular networks are public networks. It's done by Vodafone, you know, done by AT and T or Verizon. So so we've got these big massive public networks that we use that are shared entities. Um, What's happening is there's a new set of technology that allows us to now build very specific private networks. And it's enabled by their new uh, new shared frequencies, what are called shared spectrum models. So the citizens broadband radio services in the United States is a great example where they freed up all the shipboard frequencies uh, and have come up with a scheme to make those available so people can build their own networks. And the reason they would want to build their own networks is 
they, they, they may not be being adequately served by a public network or they want to segment the traffic. A great example of that being manufacturing environment where I, you know, I'm controlling all these machines. If my production line goes down, it's a serious business impact. I want more control. I want to be able to finally engineer that network. So, so you now have this emergence of, of, of private networks. And I think this is all happening at the same time. Uh, that 5G is coming out, which I think is important. So let's step back a second and just quickly talk for 5G and then I'll shift back to private. So, yeah. so what, what we think, there's a lot of hype around 5G where we see the real promise of 5G is around something that they call ultra reliable low latency communications. So how do I get very deterministic communications and very low latency communications? And there's certain applications that are enabled by that. So a couple of good examples, an autonomous truck. So if I can take... Um, you know, if I can take the person out of a truck, for example, at a mine, I can now, you know, for safety reasons, I can go down a much steeper grade, which means I can get, you know, with 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 half the blasting, I can get the same yield out of the mine. Incredible business case, but I need reliable low latency communications to enable that truck. I mean, the factory automation example I gave you, um, uh, computer vision, predictive maintenance, being able to do AI to determine, hey, this, you know, this tire is going to you know, go out on a on a on a backhoe that may be a two hundred thousand dollar tire. So so there's all these new exciting applications enabled uh, by ultra reliable low latency. Um, but in many cases, they they need to be in a private network so I can kind of control that. So so between the the emergence of these private networks, the existing public networks, what we're finding is if you take those use cases, in many cases you may have mobile. Uh, mobile, like they take that truck uh, in the mine. Um, when that truck is on the, you know, a private network, which is probably LTE right now, but eventually 5G, it's it's driving around the mine. When it goes to leave the mine with the ore in it and goes on the public highways, it still needs connectivity. You want to be able to track that, you know, track that uh, truck, make sure there may be valuable, you know, commodities in it. So I want to be able to track it, that, you know, where it is. I now need to go off that private network that I've built in the mine and onto the public network. So get into the, you know, whether if, if I'm in Arizona at Freeport McMoran, I want to go into AT&T, for example, over, over the highways to deposit something in the port. Um, the, so I, I want to be able to roam from that private network onto the public network. Uh, the converse to that is I may have a freight, you, you know, freight delivery truck that's driving on the highways that's on the public networks, enters a warehouse and distribution center, where it now wants to be, you know, roam onto the private network so that it can communicate when it's lost out, you know, connectivity to the outside world. So, so we're seeing a lot more of those case studies where you can roam to and from private networks. You know, I was just thinking visually um, as you uh, said that, and maybe we could have used these graphics in the report. Um, I, I was struck when you were saying it about um, uh, a common factor between these first two, and maybe we'll find it in, in the next three, but you know, it when you think about on the first one, we talked about applications that you know they, they were in the mainframe, then it became mainframe mini, then mainframe yeah. mini, and and then PC, and then and then PC. Uh, uh, you got the uh, mobile phone, and and then the the internet, and it's almost like we've got you know the the, the universe behind our heads in these graphics. For those yeah. of you can see, it's almost like the Big Bang theory. You know, the the edge of the universe is expanding outwards at accelerating speed. Yeah, um, and then this one that you just talked about there, you talked about the, the interoperability and and five G between private networks and and uh, sorry public networks and private networks, and there you've got you know the movement from I use one MNO for all of my IoT, and then along comes EUICC and eSIM, and now I can use any one of eight hundred MNOs because we've broken the link. Yeah. And so now I have all this choice. And then it's like, well, hold on a second. No, 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 my choice got bigger again. The edge of the universe expanded again because now there's all these private networks and anyone can buy Spectrum. You talked about, you know, buying Spectrum. Anyone can buy Spectrum and there's lots right. of, you can, as a business, you can buy, you can buy Spectrum. You can, you can, universities can buy Spectrum. Mines can buy Spectrums. The public operators are now creating private offerings. So you get, again, this world that we've had which was arguably difficult enough for 30, 40 years, suddenly in these first two, what we considered was the box around the, the problem, the edge of that box just blew away. And, and, and yeah. suddenly we're having to go to a brand new edge. Suddenly we're having to go to agnostic m &O choice and interoperability with private networks and get right. like quality of service, 
uh, enabled by you know uh, 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 different different levels of resources applied to different functions, different rules, overlaid on top of public and private. I mean, it, it's a it's another example where everything is just fragmenting and rushing outwards. I mean, that's a great way of describing it. And, and it's and it's hard because not only you have to do the integration. So how do I make sure that the authentication that's happening in the uh, in the in the enterprise network, which is, you know, maybe governed by a set of tools like at Cisco, you had your ICE product, Aruba, yep. ClearPass, um, you know, Active Directory now needs to be integrated with the co operators who have their home subscriber service, you know, typical mobile ways of authenticating and all that needs to be integrated, but then managed seamlessly. And when you add quality of service that's needed, so you you think about what URLCC, there's a term that everyone's talking about, network slicing, network which slicing. is really, Absolutely. yeah, and that's really quality of service in that private network. I mean, very focused on, it's a big advantage of 5G to do fine grain slicing. And it's, it's slicing for performance reasons, how do I get lower latency, et cetera. There's also, it's actually a big part of security. If you hear, you know, the zero trust security, the big part of how do I segment something end to end and make sure that they, you know I can't get breached. So, so just the management of that alone is just a incredible. I was thinking of the management of the app. I remember, yeah, I mean, I was uh, we knew each other in the Cisco days, as you said, full disclosure. But the the managing applications that were hybrid, that were both you know some applications behind the firewall and some were in the cloud, and having one set of management tools that would apply policy to both. Now we've got applications behind the firewall, we've got applications in the cloud, and we've got applications at the edge. But the edge, it is not a direct cable to the edge because the edge could go through different MNOs depending on how the SIM decides to switch. Right. So you've now got different paths to the edge. Um, yep. and, and so the ability to apply those quality of service or network slicing policies to those 75% of applications that are going to be at the edge is 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 a is a very difficult thing because you're then going through um different intermediaries mobile networks both public and private uh, of course i could say all of which means that you need a a a, a platform an iot platform but we're not here to talk about si well i mean what's interesting is it's part a lot of the reason i came to si was actually i looked at that problem it's one of the probably the most complicated you know, selection, management, and optimization problems I've seen. You know, how do you select, manage, and optimize your connectivity and control that path? And I, I do think it's an exciting problem. I think there's a lot of heavy lifting to to solve it, but but it's certainly fun. And uh, it's a big reason I came to SI is I actually think we're capable you know, of actually addressing that problem or mitigating it at the least. Well, um, uh, I'm going to uh, raise the stakes uh, because prediction number three, uh, if you wrapped your head around one and two, thinking, oh my word, you know, I have to learn all about this. Uh, uh, then it, it actually goes off laterally into another area because prediction number three is the ascendance of network agnostic and multi-RAT, so multi-radio access type. And yeah. um, and, I, and uh, so uh, let's just uh, talk a little bit about um, multi-RAT and, and, you know, how many rats are there? <laughs> sounds like a nature show how many rats are there and what and what do we mean by um uh, the ascendance of network agnostic and multi-rat well it, let, me, let me actually start with the agnostic so enterprises okay. really don't care what network technology what operator you know how they deliver service as long as it's secure reliable you know communications from device to cloud i mean that's all they care about and 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 they'd like to do that ideally in a cost effective way. So so they they're they're not you know they're not behold to you know hey should this be cellular should this be Wi Fi if I, if I can get the right performance and service level characteristics I, I just want to be able to deliver secure reliable and ideally cost effective communications. Now what you know so that that makes them open to any solution right anything that solves my problem that I can manage and operationalize and secure. Um, now start to take a look at what's going on. A lot in the consumer world is interesting. So the the consumer, the digital home, and a lot of the connectivity in the house has finally taken off. I mean, we have a lot of hype around the digital home, but with all of the advances we've had in technologies, um, we're starting to see modem prices, in particular, go down. You know, driving things down, where all of a sudden it can become cost effective that I can couple technologies, and and that's where you know, so I can take. That, you know, a cellular modem and put a Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or, uh, you, you know, a, a Zigbee or Thread modem in and start to couple stuff. 
And, you, you know, I think our cell phones really amplified this, you know, at first, where if you looked at, uh, you know, you look at our cell phone, this thing obviously does cellular communications, uh, but it also has, um, you know, it has embedded Wi-Fi. It's had Bluetooth to talk to yeah. peripherals. Yeah. yeah, it's even had stuff like NFC, if you think about for how I do financial. And, and the new Apple ones have got early versions of low Earth orbiting satellite. Exactly. So, you know, that great, great example of that. So, so the, the mobile phones, obviously, they're, you know, this is a thousand dollar device. So it's a lot easier for me to put those modems in. But, but I'm starting to get to the point where the consumer and the digital home, you know, with the, the pro proliferation of Wi Fi and Bluetooth and, and even Zigbee and some of the other digital home protocols, I can get a modem for under a dollar. So it all of a sudden becomes more feasible to say, hey, I'm not just going to put a cellular modem in, but I'm going to use other technologies. And that's going to give me more flexibility, um, and and that gives not you know not only could get me into a different economic structure, but if I can mix and match protocols, it can also give me more resiliency. So a great example is you know let's say um, I, I have a dog collar, and um, and that dog collar has both a cellular modem in and you know a LoRaWAN modem so this is a kind of a low and if you're not familiar with LoRaWAN it's a great technology to do low power it can go around you know anywhere from two to four kilometers so it's got pretty good range um and a you know it can, it can operate on battery for quite some time and and if you I don't know if you're I know I know the Americans will most likely be aware of this but just for the rest of the world you've got all these emerging networks out there new crowdsource type business model. So Amazon, for example, has a solution based on Laura or derivative Laura that, that's referred to as Sidewalk. Yeah. And what Sidewalk does is it takes all the, the, the next generation Echo devices. It, it has a you know LoRaWAN or at least a Sidewalk gateway that's built into it. And then it can use your home, you, you know, your home network and your broadband connectivity to get back up into Amazon. And they, they provide it for free. So essentially, I could have you know this dog collar walking around. It's using the sidewalk network, at, you know, free using a crowdsource model, um, and, and it's operating fine. Now, let's say that dog goes out of a neighborhood that maybe doesn't have sidewalk or gets to a patch where it can't talk. If I can now then flip over to the cellular network, I can continue my connectivity. So I'm operating on a free environment. And really, then only using that cellular network when I'm out of range and and can't communicate. Now, interesting one. Take um, take the satellite example. So there, the three GPP that standardizes all you know the GSMA and all the other technologies that have emerged um, recently released something called Release 17 of their standards. And as a part of that, they have something called the not the Release 17 non-terrestrial capabilities and. What that does is it allows a standard cellular modem um, and antenna with, with new microcode to be able to communicate up to the constellations of satellites that are going up there. So this was just standardized this past year and we're starting to see early production stuff going in. So Apple's an early version of it, you could think of it, their SOS stuff. But now I could have that same dog collar using multiple radio access technologies, you know, operate on Amazon sidewalk when, when you're in range, which might be 90% of the time, when the dog goes beyond a, a what's called a border router, it could switch over to cellular. And then if the dog goes up in the hills, even belong beyond the terrestrial network, it could go up to the satellite network. So it's a great example of, in this case, two modems, multiple input, but three multiple radio access technologies being combined to get a more cost-effective and even more resilient solution. So I, I can now address you know what happens when my when I'm in the hills and I, I have poor cellular coverage. You know terrestrial cellular. So it's an incredibly powerful way, uh, you know, of combining these technologies together. And that's what the enterprises are looking for. They don't care who or how I deliver it. If I can combine technologies to get better economics, more resiliency, you know, it gives me a better solution. So, so we're going to move on to the fourth one now, and 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 I think the the the. There's a difference between the first three and the fourth and the fifth. The first three are all around how the industry landscape is, you know, it, on the one hand, it's fragmenting, but on the other hand, it's coming together. Uh, yeah. and what I mean by that is that on the first first prediction, um, uh, and, you know, we're sort of predicting an acceleration of an existing trend, which is the point yeah. that we made right at the beginning. 
But, you know, you've got the uncoupling of the MNO to the SIM and the fact that the uh, uh, hyperscalers are coming in and, and the, the, the edge has now changed to become the, uh, um, uh, the edge aggregation where 75% of the applications are going there. So that's a that's a multiple parties that were operating independently all now focusing into the one area on the on the right. second area you had the public and the private networks and and and, and them coming uh, together so you have new use cases like you mentioned on the mine and then 5G and and the URL CC standard the ability to do you know quality of service uh, network slicing uh, to the edge can take policy and extend it to the edge and, and on the third one you talked about multi-rat. So these these radio access type radio tech uh, uh, frequencies they they've they've already always existed, but people use them for separate use cases. Correct. And now what you're saying is no, the device is actually uh, they're they're now getting to the price point where you can have several of them in one device, and then suddenly you get a a device that is multi-rat, and um uh, and so that's another area where all these things that were independent. If I have to take my space analogy, it's sort of the black hole. These things are now all being pulled in, and and right. and, and and you can't stop it. So so now we have this aggregation and and pulling in together, and and so that then starts to change everything. And and on the fourth one, I think the fourth one is is as a result of the first three, certain things that we always took for granted are just going to become history, and 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 we call it. The, the consumer and enterprise IoT use cases converge to create new connectivity challenges. Uh, so you've talked technically about how consumer and um, enterprise uh, uh, technology is, is now converging into the device. But it also means, I guess, that, 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 that there will be whole new market opportunities for people. And as always in those markets, certain industries or industry verticals will yep. be the ones that first take advantage of it, right? Yep, a a absolutely. And I, I think what's interesting here is, I mean, start off with the home. It turns out that home adoption has often driven the enterprise market. A great example of that's Wi-Fi, right? We, we didn't have Wi-Fi in the enterprises. People started using it at home and came back to work and said, well, why can't I use this? And you did a very good business with uh, with uh, Aaron and Meraki at, at Cisco enabling that on the enterprise side. So uh, so it's, um, it, you know, so we've seen that before. But but what we found was the home network still remained very separate from the enterprise network. And we, you know, we'd have VPNs that we could use at home um, linking back into the enterprise network. But we still manage our own home networks, and the enterprise managed, uh, you, you know, manage their own networks. Um, we, we're starting to see the, the some use cases emerge that are kind of going to break that paradigm. And the two that really stick out to me are in healthcare and home energy management. So, so let's look at healthcare first. Um, if you think about it, COVID's really changed our expectations on remote. You know, we always went to the doctor, we went to the clinic, et cetera. But with COVID, that accelerated the need for remote patient monitoring, right? We it, we needed other solutions that, that we could do that. And um, and in, in order to do that, though, um, healthcare, you know, if, if, I, if I'm doing something like a, a heart monitor, I, I can't really rely on my home network, right? If you look about it, it's, you know, I've got a broadband connectivity, you know, through a, through a, you know, a service provider. And then I've got my home Wi-Fi that's got, you know, maybe, you know, 20, 30, maybe even a hundred devices on it. And I can't be at the mercy of the, the, the consumer being smart enough to manage that. So as, as, as remote patient monitoring started, starts to pick up, um, the, the ability to rely on that home network it become, becomes a bit of a problem. Now, the, the counter to that, so as we start to put cellular devices, you know, cellular capabilities into the remote patient monitoring, but we, you know, we may be in a home that's not very well covered by cellular or, or we, you know, we still have one radio access technology. So there, there's a good example where if I can couple the home network capabilities with cellular, much like I described that dog collar, I can get to a much more resilient, powerful solution. So, so if I, you know, I may still want to use my home connectivity and broadband capabilities. If I can use the the next generation, what's you know, home protocol, whether it's Wi-Fi or the next generation is Zigbee Thread, which which adds you know IP version six and other capabilities. I could use that 
as a, you know, use my existing broadband gateway and go up, you know, and, and do remote patient monitoring reliably. Now, as a backup, I still continue to use I, cellular where, hey, if I, you know, if that if I leave the home, I go outside of the thread capabilities or Wi-Fi, I want to be able to pivot to cellular. So much like that dog collar. The other interesting angle to that is, is also the home gateway. So that home gateway right now is connecting to one broadband provider. As we start to see, particularly with 5G, we're starting to see a lot more wireless broadband or wireless fixed access. So if I look at it, um, T-Mobile, Verizon in the US have been now providing you know, broadband, home broadband connectivity over wireless. I can couple my wireline and my wireless. I have a much more resilient solution. So as you start to mix and match these technologies, not only do you get to better economics, but you get more resiliency being able to mix and match and choose the right protocols at the right time. And if one goes down, I can fall back to the other. So if I lose my home broadband connection tethered, I can go over to my wireless connection. So, so we're seeing that as a, you know, the mixing and matching of protocols to, so, to support that for, for healthcare. Home energy is even more interesting to me. Um, so if you take a look at the rising cost of energy, you think about electric vehicles and home charging, you start to look at increase with all the natural disasters, the hurricanes, the fires, particularly in the states, we're seeing a lot more, you know, generators and batteries. Um, the the home energy market uh, is changing dramatically. You, have, you know, throw solar panels to the mix where the the house may actually be producing energy. I may now need bidirectional, so I'm not just a you know getting stuff from the grid. I might be contributing to the grid. So we we anticipate that we're going to start to see huge changes in in how you do it, you manage home energy. And there, it, it, it's a combination of re-looking at energy distribution in the house. So, so there's products like SPAN. And so what SPAN does is it takes that, that the, what's been the very old technology of that electrical box, which is just you know circuits and breakers and relays, and it turns into much more of an energy, you know, a smart energy distribution. So I can say, hey, it, you know, I'm about to run my washer and dryer, I don't want to, you know, let's slow the EV charging down so I can kind of control that energy. Or, you know, I'm operating off generator power after power failure. Um, let's just let's just make sure the refrigerator gets priority. So, so you're going to start to see much more sophisticated energy in the house. And then you throw the solar panels on, and we have to really look at our existing meters. So we, you know, we do a lot of work with Itron, obviously. Um, how does that meter now become two way and understand? Hey, I'm I'm producing energy. I can now put it back to the grid, I've got my battery. So, so there's a whole bunch of stuff that I now need to integrate, how I communicate in the home with protocols like Wi-Fi and Thread, and then how do I go back up to the, you know, to the grid and start to communicate with the utility providers. So I think those are two great use cases about how the home and the, the wide area, if you want to call it that, you know, really come together and need to be managed holistically. And, and we've seen uh, exactly these two um... Uh, use cases which in Jeffrey Moore parlance crossing the chasm uh, it, it calls them bowling pins the first two industries to to move as you cross the chasm but as I was saying you know we last last week's podcast was on bioformis who are who are doing the 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 home example exactly what what you just said and we also had a um a, an example of the energy management um uh, example in an earlier um in an earlier podcast of, of the idea that the um the consumer becomes in charge and start. The consumer becomes the broker and starts buying and selling electricity, um, and uh, so the, the serial, the, the supply chain that took the electricity from generation through to the uh, consumer gets broken, and the c- consumer becomes the intermediary with a lot more choice. Uh, and um, certainly, we see a lot of innovation and uh, startup activity, and a lot. You mentioned Itron and others. It, 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 a lot of large companies uh, really accelerating their uh, digital disruption programs so that they can keep up and not get overtaken uh, as this yeah. world changes very, very rapidly. All right. Well, we're going to all of the things that we've talked about um, uh, kind of all rely on one thing, which is the final one. And it's something, of course, we always uh, talk about as SI, which is uh, the uh, the device. Uh, it, it, you know, IoT starts and ends ends with the device and although that is number five and, and although that's a, a fairly obvious intuitive statement i often say on these podcasts it's not that obvious and intuitive because a lot of people think no it starts and ends with the sim but it doesn't because 
the SIM is just one of the components that goes into the device. But but all of these use cases, you know, you think of multi-rat, um, uh, private and public um, uh, networks extending the cap the new edge aggregation uh, device, the consumer hub uh, in the home. In every one of the four that we've talked about, there's a device. And these aren't your standard devices. Aren't, uh, I mean, you can't go out buy these. There's no generic device for IoT. Uh, and and you know in its most simple form, every IoT use case requires a custom device. Yeah. And so and then most people, they don't want to hire firmware engineers, do they? Uh, you know, uh, we're not uh, people who can lay out circuit boards. Firm firmware engineers, but people who know how to do battery life management. So this prediction of 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 the device. Um, how do you think uh, everything, all of these things require more complicated, more complex, more sophisticated devices? Um, so how is that going to be uh, approached in 2023? Yeah, and this is probably my favorite of the predictions. Um, um, I gave you my first one of my, you know, I, I love the Gartner quote about 75% of all data processed outside the cloud. Gartner has one other quote, quote that I think really is applicable to this, and that is 80% of all IoT projects fail which is what why we're not seeing that kind of the, the kind of uptake that we had predicted you know years ago and then re this year we did some research with Kaleido um, Kaleido research did a, a survey of over 750 enterprises and they and, and there was about what was what was challenging around IOT devices and deployment and um, while while connectivity was a big issue and how do you get global connectivity which we've lived and been trying to solve for the the aha or the kind of the the really big realization that came was, was 84%. So the by far the biggest issue was the device and how difficult it is to divide, you know, design devices that may have to operate on battery power, take take itron, you know, meters, need to be out there in the field for 15 to 20 years if it's a gas or a water meter that doesn't have power. So how do you design those? How do you design stuff where you've got a moving target that operators may be changing their roles or they want to, you know, they don't allow you to roam. They uh you, you you have to be localized to to, to operate on a on a network uh, to use low power optimization. So so it's incredibly difficult to design these devices, and and it's getting harder. Um, if you actually look at a lot of the geopolitical stuff that we're hearing, all the supply chain stuff. So whether it's the war in Ukraine, it's you know you know potential impending you know Taiwan, a, a whole supply chains have been messed up, exacerbated by COVID and some of the geopolitical environments. So I really need to be able to divide, you know, design these devices with you know as much flexibility to be able to mix and match those protocols as we talked about, um, and, and and really you know be able to switch operators if we need to because of a you know a commercial change, a regulatory change, etc. So I, and at the same time, it's incredibly hard to get firmware engineers. I mean, if you take a look at it, the last time I looked at Indeed, there was um, there was over three thousand openings for firmware engineers. And you're competing with Tesla, you know, and other very high profile jobs. So it's incredibly hard to get these skills. So what's interesting is as we get more and more emphasis on the device, you know, to enable all of these, I mean, really powerful business cases around IoT, um, as, as you know, you go through all the ones you've had in your podcast, you know, Bioformus and everything. Um, but um, but I, you, you really have a you know the, the decks are a little bit stacked against you in terms of like dealing with the supply chain stuff and getting the firmware engineers so you you really need as much design expertise or at least how do i how do i actually start to to to, to solve and 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 design flexibility in there and one of the ways to do it interesting enough is software right you know how can you get device intelligent software that can adapt to the changes if a new network operator or I, you know i've got a a modem that is you know sub gigahertz where I could actually change my technology profile, you know, move from Zigbee to Thread, you know, as as protocols emerge, have software that that essentially replace, you know, has has done all the heavy lifting, all the testing on different networks, and and can then select, manage, and optimize connectivity, enable to, you know, to in order to to protect that device. So so how do you not only de design the device well, but have the intelligence embedded in it so that it can select you know the and, and optimize the network technology and operators and 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 so what you, you're saying is that um it, i always have uh, pictures when when people speak so the picture i got when you were talking about that is all this complexity that we talked about on the podcast so far is kind of uh 
it was already difficult, but now we've got a ball that's bouncing down the stairs and we'll never catch yeah. it. I mean, right. what we're basically saying is, unless you use something that is scalable, like, like device resident software, where you codify all of this um, uh, complexity into a standard plug-in, if you like, to yep. the device, you will never catch the ball that's bouncing down the stairs. So what the industry needs uh is a um is the ability to um you know in a kind of a weird way it almost sounds like twilio doesn't it you know when when we yeah. were looking at these applications uh, uh several years ago um uh, uh and all these applications are going to be created for iphones but nobody knew how to do the comms and twilio said here's a plug-in it was apis just use these APIs. We'll worry about the comms. You don't have to write the write the code to be able to make a, a phone call, to maybe to do a video call, to send a text, use a, a chat bot or whatever. It's almost like that. Is that the industry needs to solve that problem because this co complexity is, is getting exponentially bigger. But if there was a standard plugin, then uh, which where most of this is codified, then um uh i guess what you're saying is adoption would accelerate massively absolutely and i think your twilio for iot analogy is great so it's, it's not just that it you know that software kit and the apis uh, but it's also the integration that twilio had done you know how do i take if i'm going to do an sms how do i integrate into each operator's smsc which is the you know how do you send the sms so so all the network and operator integration as well as the the management platform how do i actually manage that that software and the sdks out there so i think that's a perfect analogy the way you described it do you think a uh, bit of a loaded question larry do you think there's a chance we might see that in 2023 i think in january of 2023 there there may be a very good chance that you may see a solution like that at which point my lawyer tells you to stop and don't Correct. say anything else. <laughs> but um, pulling back to the um, uh, predictions report, uh, thanks for going uh, uh, through that. Um, and um, I mean, the, the, the one constant um, is, of course, a uh, uh, change. Uh, and this is an incredibly exciting area, IoT. And again, the visions of, you know, everything is expanding and somehow we need to shrink it back and, and 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 take this complexity away because because although we have to do podcasts explaining it at the end of the day people say i i, I actually you know success i always say success is technology is when it becomes invisible and and we need to make all of this stuff invisible um and you know we go back to our, our founders who created zigbee you never think about Zigbee. In fact, most people, unless you're in the industry, don't even know what Zigbee is. But it's in, I believe, over 4 billion devices that are used every day around the world. And so that's incredible uh, technology that has become invisible. You use it multiple times a day, you just don't realize it. And so that really is the challenge for us as industries to get all of this, because it's about to get more complicated. It's a kind of a good news, bad news podcast. Everything is about to expand and all these different things that were different silos are about to come together and they come together in the device so we've got to solve that last that last uh uh problem that we um uh danced around without being specific right uh, right there uh but but thanks larry for um uh, joining me on on this i would say to our listeners i hope you enjoyed this one this is a different type of podcast to the ones that we uh have done so far um everything that we've talked about is available um, on uh, the SI uh, website. It's called the IoT Predictions Report in a very nice little format uh, that you can actually um, uh, go through. And, uh, and and as I said, right at the very beginning, um, it, 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 it is our number one. People are very interested because they really want to know uh, what's going to happen. If you're building a device or you're going to do an IoT project that's going to have a, a lifetime of 8, 10, or if it's a meter, 15 or more years, it's really important to have at least some idea of how it's going to change because in 12 years time it excuse me 12 months time it won't look exactly as it does uh today and if you go back on the the previous uh, four year uh, predictions um and i'm sure some people out there do do that uh then actually they have all changed although there've been sort of constant themes but they've changed and, and they basically just accelerated and become more complicated, the, the rate of change. So so um, it, it's really important to uh, see what's going on. 
And uh, we do this work and we put this uh, material out there uh, just because people uh, do ask us for it. And if any of you want to talk to us um, uh, about this or anything else that we've said, then just um, just reach out and we'd be uh, glad to uh, start a dialogue with you. But in the meantime, uh, Larry, um, uh, thanks very much. Um, uh, thanks for joining us. Um, I don't know which uh, IoT podcast you listened to that caused you to reach out, but it was probably must have been a good one. <laughs> yeah, I have to go back and uh, figure it out. <laughs> maybe maybe that will happen as a result of this one. Who knows? Um, but um, thanks, everyone, for uh, listening. This has been the IoT uh, Leaders podcast uh, with me, your host, Nick Earl, the CEO of SI, with my special guest this week, Larry Soccer, uh, who runs SVP for SI, who runs our strategy and alliances. And was, I think, 26 years at Accenture. Is yep. that right, Larry? Yeah, 20 yeah 26 years, years. Uh, at Accenture. Uh, so a great a great CV, lots of history, and um, uh, now, in the, now working in the exciting world of IoT. So thanks for listening, and I look forward to talking to you all again on a future podcast. Thanks, great. and bye. Thanks, Larry.